<clears throat> just uh, well, good evening, everyone. This is Mel from Sneakers Corner. Welcome to so many people that, that are in the chat there. Um, today we have the honor to have our special guest, Odin Lafontaine. Oh, and I don't know if he's here. <laughs> you know he's mine. <laughs> and also Murad, um, uh, a guy who everyone I'm sure is familiar with. But um, Odin, I'd like you to give everyone a, a brief introduction to who you are, particularly mm -hmm. for those who may not have seen our earlier video together. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and, and who you are and okay. what your connection uh, is? <laughs> so uh, I'm French. <laughs> I, I'm, I work on Islam. Um, I've been working on Islam since maybe 10 or 15 years, something like this. Um, I've been doing serious work on Islam since 10 years. Since I've met Edouard Marie Galez, which is, uh, who is a Belgian scholar, um, a theologian, and who wrote a tremendous thesis about Islam's origins called The Messiah and His Prophet. He has got a website, you can go check, uh, check his work. It, uh, his website is rootsofislamthroughhistory.com. Um, I guess we'll, we'll fill in the, um, the complete address in the description thereafter. Um, and so I've taken an interest in Islam because I've met some Muslims and uh, had discussions with them. And I, I felt um, a bit troubled by their claims. Uh, what they claim to be, what the, the, they claim the Quran to be, once I read it, uh, was not what it was supposed to be. And uh, I thought there was something odd uh, at the beginning, uh, something odd in the origins of Islam. And so I started uh, studying the, um, the tremendous work, all the, the um, all the all all of what the, the scholars have done, and it's since 20, 30, 40 years, it's been a kind of revolution in this uh, in this field of um, in this field of work. Uh, scholars have um, made many many discoveries, and what uh, Gales Edouard Marie Gales did is he tried to, to make a sort of um, a synthesis of all those discoveries in 2004, at the time of his thesis. And um, <clears throat> one, is, one of his main, um, his main discoveries, his, 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 his main, um, what he, he gave to the public, is a new exegesis of the Quran. Um, that there have been many, many works on, on Mecca, for example, on the, um, on archaeology and on many many topics, but the the thing about this exegesis is it's, it's, it's quite um, nobody knew it. it. It comes from the um, tradition of the Eastern Christian who speak Arabic and also for some of them Aramaic, without um, uh, without being forced to to in, into the um, Arabic Islamic concept. As for example, when when uh, um, a non-Muslim Arabic speaker reads Bait in the Quranic text, he is not forced to to read it and to understand it as being the Kaaba of the Mecca. He can read it as being a house and also as being the temple, because Bait in all of the Hebrew and Aramaic tradition is, has always been Jerusalem's temple. You see, this is the kind of work he did with some uh, Eastern Christian scholars, and it led him to his thesis, um, the Messiah and his prophets. And I've worked with him a lot. I've um, written um, a vulgarization of his work, which was the first edition of my book, The Great Secret of Islam. And I've kept on working on Islam and Islam's origin. I've kept on um, uh, reading the, the new discoveries, reading the, um, what, what the scholars uh, discovered. And they discovered a lot since 2004. And this led me to this new edition, which you see on your screen, The Great Secret of Islam, the red edition, the 2020 edition, 
which is a synthesis of Gale's work and also many many other many other people's work. Um, as for me, uh, I come from um, uh, a commercial background. Uh, I've done an MBA. I've worked as a strategy consultant, which means I'm not a scholar myself, but I'm used to to the scientific method, the scientific yeah. methodology, which is what I, I think did on a daily basis when I was a strategy consultant, and which is the basis also, or should be the basis also of the historical analysis. And um, this is maybe what I can um, I can bring to to the Islamic studies uh, is um, my 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 skills in terms of um, scientific methodology. Uh, yeah. I should also add that I am part of a um, French organization that uh, studies uh, Christianity's origin, also with um, uh, Edouard Marie Galez. Uh, we study it um, with um, with the uh, with the um, <coughs> we study it with the tradition uh, from the the point of view of the tradition of the Eastern Christian. We, there is something um, also very groundbreaking in the field of study, um, and it's all linked. You you have to. To know a bit about um, Christianity's uh, Christianity's origin, to know a bit about the um, Aramaic cultural background of the Middle East, to Absolutely. really really understand the the context of uh, Islam's origin, it's all linked. So I, I would kind of view you as someone who has distilled Galay's work down, and maybe what my job is to distill even your work down to uh, to make it more um, understandable to the public and maybe get it out to a wider audience maybe murad do you want to jump in and um tell us a little bit about yourself while we're at it well thank you for having me once again mel and i want to say that this is a great honor to to be speaking with odon lafontaine and i want to say that i'm nowhere near this uh, this caliber this level of uh, mm -hmm. this author but uh, what I am is that I've been studying Islam like an amateur for more than 10 years. And I am an ex-Muslim myself, and my original language is Arabic. So this is my mother tongue. So I see through the, uh, like the hoaxes that the, the people give to the West, how they translate the Quran and make like uh, a faulty translation and all this stuff. And I'm very interested in the Aramaic roots for the Quran, the Syriac, the Hebrew, and all this stuff. So, uh, and anything that's hard, I like it. So, where is Noah's Ark? This could be the hardest question ever. Then give it to me. I'm like an Indiana Jones in this stuff. <laughs> so, some people know me as Sheikh Murad when I do an Islamic topic. And when if I'm speaking about a biblical topic, it will be Saint Murad, and this is just for fun. I'm not a sheikh, and I'm, I'm not a saint. So that's it. Yet. You're not a saint yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, fantastic uh, to hear from both of you. Um, Odin, why not um, introduce your, your topic? You're going to be looking, so I believe, at the Quranic evidence for your thesis. So um, mm -hmm. introduce us however you like. Okay, the, the thing is, we, we um, most scholars read the Quran, but they don't read it as a, um, as a, whole, as a whole. They, they have um, partial readings of the Quran. They read surahs, they read verses, but they, they, don't, they don't get to a, a global exegesis, which is uh, what Gales did which is what I will try to, to present um, this evening. A global exegesis, it is um, when one tries to understand a word by comparing it to every other occurrence in the same text and by deducting his, um, his meaning. So, and uh, this is what we try to do. And when we read the Quran like this, we see um, a completely different story than the standard Islamic narrative. 
it, it is very, very amazing to see that there is a kind of secret in Islam and it is um, encased, uh, encapsulated uh, in the Quran. This is what I will try to, to, to present uh, here. With uh, the presentation will be uh, a bit technical, so don't don't be afraid. You, 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 the video will be on the YouTube channel. You can always uh, get back to it, and um, it is a very big presentation. I, I won't be able to make it uh, to, to to have it all this evening. Um, I will do only the first part, which is point one to to four. And um, another time, we will see the point five and six. Um, so the thing about the the Quran, to get to to know um, the Quran, one has to 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 understand who who are the protagonists of the Quran. Who does the Quran speak of? And uh, be, before seeing the names of the protagonists, such as the Jews, the Christians, and so. The main protagonists of the Quran are the one who wrote it, or the one who composed it. Hence, the preacher or the preachers, we don't know, whose preaching seems to be the basis of the Quranic text. And they tell, this tells us about their language, their ethnicity, their community, their cultural environment, environment their religious training, their knowledge, their objective, their motivation, um, for example, we see an um, Aramaic background in many, many words of the Quran. Uh, I've chosen two, two examples. The Jehen, Jehen in French, Jehenna uh, uh, in, in English, Gehana Mana. Uh, it's a valley of Hinnom. It's in Jerusalem and it has become a synon synonymous f um, with hell and punishment in the Jewish and Christian um, culture. And it is also uh, synonymous with hell in the Muslim tradition with many occurrences in the Quran. What does it tell us? It tells us, uh, obviously, that the, um, there was an, an Aramaic background to the, um, to the Quran, to the, to the preachers who, whose, whose preaching are in the Quran. Another example is the expression, a very strange expression, Mother of God. We see in, um, in Surah 5, uh, verse 116, uh, and, um, which has led uh, Muslims to believe that the, the Trinity for Christian was composed by, with uh, the Father, the Mother, and the Son. And uh, Muslims believed it. At, a, at, a, at such a point that the, some of them invented uh, um, an imaginary cult of the mother of God, who <coughs> a cult a cult for some um, unknown um, Arabian Christians. Whereas the solution is very simple: in the Aramaic Christian culture, the mother of God is the Holy Spirit, and nowadays it is still uh, used. This image is still used by the, the Eastern Christian. You, you see there that the cultural background is um, is not um, is not uh, told in the Quran, but it is written there, and we have to to study it and take it into account. And we see. Can I mm -hmm. can I interject yes, there for a second? Is, is it because uh, that the the word ruah spirit? Is feminine. Is that part of the reason why the the view Holy yes, Spirit yes. as the Mother of God? Yes, it's um, it's it's part of the um, of the um, how, how can I say that? Um, it's not a riddle, but um, a kind of riddle um, when when you play with words. The uh, yeah. the the, um, the Eastern Christian have invented this uh, this way of speaking of the Trinity. Of the Holy Trinity yeah. as being father, mother, and son, and son. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I think it's Gales who found this because he he once visited a, a patriarch, an Eastern patriarch, and he, he asked him about the mother of God, and the patriarch laughed yeah. and uh, told him, "Yeah, look on the wall. On the wall there was um, a painting or drawing or something uh, um, uh, worshiping the Holy Trinity and being described as." Uh, father, mother, and son. 
can I wow. can I just yeah. jump in? Yeah. Uh, the Quran in in some point he mixes Mary that uh, she was part of the Trinity, but I found that there is this Coleridian heresy that went on in Haran, but then it died off. So don't you think that uh, this is a mixing in the Quran that it uh, maybe misunderstood something, and it was speaking about a certain heresy, Christian heresy? You see, uh, when you do research, you have to abide by uh, the Occam's razor, which means the simplest explanation is often, most often the, the better. What, what I just told is very simple, and it makes a lot of sense with the, the text. Uh, the, 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 the preacher um, critiques, criticizes the, um, the Holy Trinity uh, for what it is, really. Mm. The Holy Trinity is the Father, the, the Mother, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. Uh, mm. For sure, one, we could argue that it might have been a, a cult somewhere, a, a real cult, not an imaginary one, a real cult like uh, the one you, you mentioned, but it, it's so much more, more complicated than, than the than simple explanation that I just, I just gave you, uh, which is basically what is written. Can I just but jump in? It's taking into account uh, an Aramaic background for it. It, that's, that is still um, a usage that still occurs today. That's what you said a few minutes ago, isn't it? Yes, that this yes, idea yes. of the Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah. yes. In, in, in the Aramaic-speaking communities and the, 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 or the formerly Aramaic-speaking communities of uh, Eastern Christians, th th don't forget that uh, there, was, there, was, there were um, up to one million, maybe one million and a half Aramaic-speaking uh, Christians up until the, the the year 2000, the Iraqi Christians they, they spoke Suret, Suret, which is an Aramaic dialect, and there were um, hundreds of thousands of them before the wars, and there were also uh, Aramaic-speaking Christians in Syria, uh, and they, they they kept on the tradition, the tradition they, they, from the first centuries of their um, Christianization. Mm. So okay. um, uh, this was the, an introduction. Uh, who does the Quran, uh, the Quran speak of? Uh, the Quran also speak of, uh, tells us about the audience of the preacher. The preacher. You see, I'm pursuing it in um, reading between the between the between the lines. What is not written? Reading what is not written in the Quran, because when we read the text, like the Quran, when we read uh, preaching. It also tells us about the audience of the preacher, of or of the preachers, because when we look at what the preachers, with the preachers decide to tell the audience and what not to tell them, it tells us about the audience. It tells us about what they already know. It tells us about what they what needs to be explained and taught and taught to them. Um, we also have their remarks. We also have their objection. We also can um, can read the assent, and so we can um, guess, not guess, but we can uh, see. Uh, it's a sort of a Chinese uh, portrait. Portrait. Uh, we can see who is the audience, and mainly we will see that the audience is uh, is Christian. Um, as for the the people that are named in the Quran, the categories of people. Uh, this is the, the main part of my, uh, my expose. We have to, to, to look very thoroughly uh, into them. What are they? And for this, uh, there are two, two tools that are very, very uh, useful to get the, the gist of the Quranic text. It's the Quran Getaway uh, website, which has been made by uh, Dr. Brubaker. And um, it's it's uh, Islamic equivalent, which is uh, corpus.quran.com. Uh, ah, I've put the same. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've put the same um, the same address for the two websites. The the one on the right uh, okay. is corpus.quran.com. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, this one is is well known. The other one, Quran Gateway, is a bit more sophisticated. 
it has made, been made by, by scholars for scholars it requires uh, did, hmm? did you yes, say no? it was created, did you say it was created by robert kerr no not robert who, kerr but, uh, dr daniel dan brubaker oh okay sorry okay Mr. the Argentina. one who, who studied yeah. um, the discrepancies and uh, in the, the early in the earliest manuscript of the quran yeah I've, I've met him in an uh, Inara meeting uh, two years ago. Yeah. And uh, those, with those websites, you, you can have, um, uh, I, I don't know the English word, something like, in French, it's concord, concordance. Concordance. You can see, you can look for an Arabic root in the text and have all of its occurrences in the Quran. And this is, which is very useful to compare. The, the meaning of a word in one verse with the meaning of the same word in another verse and so on. And with this, without knowing Arabic, but you have to, to know a bit about grammar, about um, linguistics, you, you can really get into the text. And, um, and so you can really understand who are the people that are named in the Quran. And uh, those people, <coughs> as I've... Um, I've checked it. Um, are the are the following uh, according to the um, the number of occurrences in the Quran? Which this is a, a counting that I I made myself, uh, which was a, a very tremendous work because um, I, I looked for every occurrences of those uh, of those words and checked it with the others and so on. And so the, the people that the Quran speaks the most of are the Kufar, or the people that are described with the KFR roots. You see, it's almost 500 occurrences. Thereafter, you have the Mushrikun, the people that are described with the use of the SRK root, uh, the Associationists, and uh, the, the people that are linked to a Kitab, a book with the Katibi roots. And thereafter, it's very, um, <clears throat> we have a very, very less occurrences of the other people, the, the Judeans, as Yahud or as Hud, uh, the sons of Israel, the Nazarenes, the Nasara, the believers and the submitters, the people of Pharaoh, people of the gospel, which is the only mention of uh, Christian uh, people, uh, one occurrence only. And uh, there are also many, many of the other categories huh, which I've written uh, uh, here, Roman, Sabian, Hippocrates, and so on. But um, this is very compelling that there is no Masih in the Quran. There is no Arab Christian, no etymologically correct Arab Christian, because the, the, the right name for Christians is Masih in Arabic. And it's not Nazarene. Nazarene is something else. Uh, we would see it uh, on the next part of the expose. And why is it that there is no, absolutely no mention of the Masih? This is very, very strange. Is it because it's obvious everybody is Masih? Or at least the audience is Masih, is Christian Arabic? You see, that's also something we have to, to, to take into account. And so um, the Quran speaks of all those uh, categories, and we will see uh, category by category for the for the main one, for the Kufars, for the Mushrikun, and for the Al Al Kitab who they are. So who are the Kufars? Kufar. Um, the, they are the misbelievers according to the standard Islamic narrative, mainly the people who don't believe in Islam, who don't believe in Muhammad's prophecy. Um, but this is not the real etymology of the word. The KFR root does not mean misbelieve. It means to cover. So the Kufar, the Kafir, the Kafirun, uh, in plural, uh, are the coverers, the one who cover. And we have 27 occurrences of this word Kafir and many, many, many other occurrences of a different form of the KFR root in the sense of covering, disbelieving, denying, rejecting, and also forgiving. I've checked all of those occurrences. I won't uh, present them all now. 
but um, one has to do this work to understand what the Kufar are. But you see, we will understand who are the Kufars and who are the Al Al Kitab and who are the Mushrikun by looking at the interactions between those protagonists. What do they do um, uh, one with each other? What are the, their relations? So, as I told you in the standard Islamic narrative, a Kufar is a, a misbeliever, a non Muslim, an infidel, and it, it has become a kind of kind of an insult. But uh, as we know, the Arabic language is very, very, very close to Aramaic and Hebrew. And in Aramaic, the Kaifer root also means cover, to cover. And we have uh, examples of this, uh, of this root, of this word in the Bible, for example, in Genesis, when uh, Noah kafars the ark. He covers it with uh, uh, oil, bitumen, uh, bitumen. <laughs> And from this um, first meaning to cover, we have many derived meanings. It is always like this in the Semitic language. We have um, a basic meaning, uh, a fundamental, a ground meaning, and from this we have many uh, derived meanings. So uh, in Aramaic, it can mean also to cover the fault, to cover the sin, and then to forgive or to make atonement. It, it can also mean to cover something, then hence to keep silent, to pass over in silence, to deny, or even to apostatize. Apostatize, or to, It also means a cover, a lid, a pitch, a bow. And in Aramaic, in Arabic, it has similar meanings. Cover also means to mask, to shield, and it can mean to forgive. Uh, as for example, I, I've made the... Um, um, I've, I've written the first uh, verse, second verse of um, Surah 47, as, uh, which tells us that God kafars with two F, which is the inten uh, intensive form of the word, of the verb. He kafars the wrong deeds, which means he, he kind of forgives the wrong deeds. He, he does not misbelieve the wrong deeds. He um, forgives them. And, can um, I, can yes? I just say that uh, this in Arabic it would be kafara. So yes. you have kafara, and if you put the diacritical marks, you have, of course, all these readings. So one could be kafara, one could be kafara. It's the same three letters, but it's a matter of uh, diacritical marks at this point. Mm -hmm. and, um, if if you want to 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 get more deeply into this um, this surah this surah forty seven, uh, Edouard Marigalet studied it in detail the, the beginning because it is a very very complex con uh, not that complex but a very um, a very remarkable construction um, concentric construction um, with the the verses that um, respond one to each other and it is um, by, by um, studying this construction that he, he understood that the, um, that one of the Muhammad uh, mentioned in the Quran is an interpolation. He wrote an article on it, which is which has been published in the last uh, Inara volume, volume 10, which was published last, uh, at the beginning of the year. And you can also see it on, um, on his Academia uh, Page. So this is uh, for the, the Kufas. Then who are the Mushrikun? Uh, the SRK roots. Mushrikun means those who associate, those who commit the shirk, which is uh, the association. They are the associationists. And we find many occurrences of this root. And according to the standard Islamic uh, narrative, uh, they are supposed to be idolaters, pagans, polytheists, uh, people who give associates to God. But this is very, very strange as an, ex an explanation because, um, because basically um, the, a Christian cannot be a polytheist. And... Um, this this, um, this this word uh, the, the standard Islamic narrative tries to tell us that there were some pagans 
at the time of Muhammad. And those pagans did associate uh, something with God, with the one God. But it cannot be because a pagan doesn't know the one God. He doesn't know the, the concept of it. So he cannot associate anything with the one God that he doesn't know. For example, uh, can you imagine that um, a Greek, an ancient Greek, will, will uh, associate uh, Aphrodite with God? He doesn't know God. This is a nonsense, a complete nonsense. The only uh, way that this expression, mushrikun, can make sense, it is, um, it, it is uh, uh, if it is an, an attack on a monotheistic faith from a monotheistic point of view. And we have uh, seen such an uh, such a news of the associate Mushri um, Esaka root in the rabbinic literature against the Christians before Islam. So basically, Mushrikun it, it pertains to Christian in our logic, and it pertains to Trinitarian Christians, the one who says that God is uh, Father, Creator, uh, Holy Spirit, and is also Jesus. So, once you have this in mind, and once you also have in mind what I said about the absence of the Masih in the Quran, one could think that uh, the Quranic preacher and his audience consider themselves as being the true Christian, the true disciple of the Masih, of Al Masih, Jesus, against the wrong Christian, which would be Trinitarian Christians. And I think it is the meaning of Mushrikun, and it is its, its, own, its only meaning. Besides, um, can I just jump? In? Yes, 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 Mel. Can I just jump? In? Considering that the Islamic narrative has forced a different meaning onto it, um, the idea of a polytheist, would this be part of the reason be, behind trying to present pre Islamic Arabia as full of polytheists, despite the fact that there's plenty of evidence that there were. Um, lots of Christians in the populated areas, a far, a far cry from the, the picture that they would like to present. Is that part of the reasoning behind um, uh, the way that they agreed the to The reason of this invention is to, 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 to create a sort of blank page on, on which Islam history can be written. And so they invented um, a past full of pagans and polytheists because... Um, a pagan or a polytheist could not fathom the very idea of a one God. Hence, Muhammad's preaching was divine. You see, uh, it's, uh, the, um, it's, it's a very strong apologetic. It, it's the same apologetic as um, having Muhammad being an illiterate person who did not uh, know how to read or write, which is false. But... Um, you see, if Muhammad was a pagan, if his audience was pagan, if they didn't know anything about the one God, how come this idea came unto them? It must be a divine revelation. So it's an apologetic uh, argument. And also it fits with the text. When you see Mushrikun in the text, and when, when you are in the 8th or 9th or 10th century, inventing Islam's history, inventing the standard Islamic narrative, you have to, to make with what you have, which is the Quranic text. And in the Quranic text, there are those Mushrikuns, so why not invent uh, pagan, uh, pagan uh, why not invent uh, pagans, uh, paganic past? Can this I just... Uh, of Jahidia. It is very, very important for the, um, the, the, um, the functioning of Islam. Islam function as, um, as, uh, as a sense of history. It gives us, it gives history a goal, and for for this you have to start with um, a starting point, which is paganism, which is um, barbarism, which is the jahiliya. Uh, you have the revelation, which is the instrument of progress, and through this progress, through the revelation, through the Islamic revelation, you will come to the. The, the, the bright future, which will be the, the world completely Islamicized and the, um, the Day of Judgment. We, we have exactly the same pattern 
in all the progressive progress ideologies, um, we always have um, uh, a past of barbarism. For example, the Middle Age, the Middle Ages um, in Europe, which is supposed to be uh, uh, completely awful. <laughs> we have a kind of revelation, which is the um, the 18th century, the Enlightenment, the philosophy, the, the reason, uh, and so on. And through this revelation, there will be a progress of humanity uh, to a bright future, to um, a, a world which which would um, which would be ridden which would be ridden of evil. Can this I is, just uh, uh, add something? Yes, of course, of course. Of uh, course. About about uh, why did they create this pagan past? I think there could be an easy answer. Just look at who is writing, and where is he from? Most of these people they came from Balkh area, which is the Central Asian area. And at this part, you had this what they call today Kabat Zoroaster, like the shrine or the Kaaba mm -hmm. of Zaradusht. Mm -hmm. And at this place, you had uh, the Buddhist uh, statues, and they were pagans at here. This is the only place that fits the same story. So they injected the same story that they saw with their eyes into the Muhammad, but they put it in the Hijaz. I think that's mm -hmm. why they did this. Yes, yes, it's um, um I I think um, that's yeah, Mel. We don't hear you, Mel. There's something yeah, wrong I just think you. um I think it makes more sense that the, the writers are in an Aramaic speaking area rather than way off in the Balk. I think that might be a later. No, I'm speaking about hadith. I'm rather. speaking about hadith mill. You get the idea that Mushrikun mm -hmm. is, uh, oh, is hadith. Hadith from hadith. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Without Tabari, without Tabari and Bukhari, you don't know what is Mushrikun unless you do the hard work and you will come to this conclusion that this is Christians only. Man, this is not such hard work to, to know what Mushrikuns yeah. are. Because at the time of Tabari, there were plenty of uh, Jews calling the, the Christian also Mushrikun in their language. The, the thing is, you know, uh, Murad, the um, paganism uh, did not last very long. The Christianization of the world was a, a very uh, silent and massive phenomenon at the first, second, third century. And um, even in Central Asia, the um, Christianization uh, spread and uh, in the 7th or 9th century um, we, we don't have pagan Buddhists we have post-Christian Buddhism which, mm. have, which has taken into account some Christian ideas and they are not really pagans but they could be seen as pagans by Muslims or, or maybe by, by, by Jews but um, you see, it's a, it's a kind of a, a, dig, a digression. Digression. We should we should uh, focus on our topic. Um, yes. So let's get back uh, to the core. Let's let's go back to it. To to it. Who are the Mushrikun? They, basically, they are the Christians, and we will see that in the Quranic text, it makes sense. Uh, every time we we see Mushrikun, and we apply the uh, Christian meaning to it, it makes sense. It makes sense to the to the phrase, to the verse, to the everything fits together fits. And so uh, now uh, we have to to look into the people of the book, the Al Al Kitab. Um, we have thirty two occurrences of the expression as Al Al Kitab. Al Al Kitab meaning the the Al is is a, a word which derives from the tent. I think the tent of the scripture. The, the one who are in the same tent. And we have also 46 other occurrences that I've checked, at least, uh, this is my counting, in which the word kitab is used to define a community, a group of people, according to their use of the kitab. And there are many other occurrences of the word kitab, which uh, does, does not pertain to um, a religious use of the word or a community. So did I hear you right? Sorry, did I hear you right that you said it meant tent of the book? Yes, but you see, it's not exactly the book. I will um, explain it thereafter. 
Hal, le okay. word Hal, Hal, le, 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 the basic meaning, the first meaning was tent, the tent. Okay. As in the uh, tent for nomads, for example. And also, it would connect with the festival of the boots, the Jew that Jewish idea of, of having the Ark of the Covenant inside a tent. Is no, I don't think so. Ark? I think it's a very, um, very Arabic word used by by people who use tents, uh, yeah. and they, they use it as an image to to designate a group of person, the person who share the same tent, which means the group of so Hal al Kitab means the group of the people of the kitab. Okay. And so according to the standard Islamic narrative, this expression people of the book Al Al Kitab means either Jews or Christian or Muslims, Jews or Christ Jews and Christian, or Jews and Christian and Muslim. And it depends on the context. So it's a very, very strange word because um, those people are very different indeed. Jews are not Christian and Muslims are not Jews nor Christians. And so it's very strange to have the same the same expression to to designate all of these people, where well, they are so different. So we'll see. I would that just. This, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, Mel. I would. Um, yeah, I would suggest that one of the reasons why there's this emphasis on the people of the book might be to do with the Iraqi background in the, in that um, Manichaeism from the mm -hmm. third century really emphasised the importance of scriptures. So you have a, a, a bit like Jay Smith would say, the man and the book, you know? So maybe mm -hmm. that's part of the, the, the reasoning behind it. Yes, 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 it might be. But you see, um, El, the, um, the Kitab is not really a book in Arabic. Uh, a yeah. book is a mushaf, a, um, a religious book. The first Quranic um, books were mushafs and not Kitabs. A Kitab, etymologically, it is what has been put in writing, what has been prescribed, what has been ordained. It is the sense right. of the law, in the sense of the Torah. And uh, yeah. it is exactly the, the same meaning as in Hebrew for Torah, the, the Hebrew word for Torah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. uh, you see, people of the book, they are not the people of the book, but are the people of the prescri prescription, the people of the law. And, yes, um, it is very strange to have this expression um, designating the, the Christians as they are not people of the book, not people of the law and the prescription, and uh, they are the people of the gospel, but the gospel is not a book. The gospel is a person, it is Jesus Christ. And the, the, the Christian always defended themselves as uh, not being people of the book, but the people of Christ. So. Again, uh, something very odd in the um, standard Islamic narrative. Um, and we will see uh, that this narrative is uh, completely wrong. It is a sort of um, reimagination, reinvention of the text, of what the text really means. And for this, we have to take a deep dive into the Quran and to look at the, all of the occurrences of the expression, the people of the book. So I've listed them all here, and I've classified them into um, main theme, thematics, main themes. And um, firstly, we, if we want to know what the people of the book are, we have to look into the Quran as, uh, and, and see what the Quran tells us about the people of the book. And we see that some of the people of the book, the people of the book, have made very great offenses. People of the book, uh, some of them have covered. They have been kufar. So uh, you see this in this verse. Neither those who cover among the people of the book nor the associationists appreciate that a blessing from your Lord should descend down upon you. So the people of the book are kufars. They also are deceptive, as uh, some of them would have liked to lead you astray. They also refuse to believe in the evidence, and they also are kufars. Because let's say one part of the people of the book believe at the beginning of the day what has been broke down on those who believe, and be coverers at the end of the day. 
perhaps these people will come back from their error. They are also, they refuse, they still refuse to believe in the evidence. Or people of the book, why do you cover the verses of God while you are witnesses? And uh, there are um, coverers against God. People of the book, why do you cover the verses of God when God is witness of what you are doing? Uh, what they do, <laughs> what other great offenses? If the people of the book believed, it will be better for them. There are some who have faith, but most of them are perverts. They have no faith. They are perverts. There will be no one among the people of the book who will not have faith in him, Jesus, before his death. And on the day of the resurrection, he will be witness against them. They refused the Messiah. They did not have faith in Jesus. This is one of the many, many, um, it can, could be the, the biggest offense uh, <laughs> of, of the people of the book in the, in the Quran. They also refused the scripture. What does the scripture told them? Told them uh, say, O oh, people of the book, do you reproach us for anything other than believing in God, in what has been brought down to us, the gospel, and in what has been brought down before the Torah? But most of you are perverted. What do they not believe? What do they, um, what do they refuse to believe? I think they still, this is the same um, claim as the, the former. They refuse the messiahship of Jesus. Which is been, which is uh, stated clearly in the scriptures. Uh, also, they are kufars. Have you seen the hypocrite thing to the breast when covered among the people of the book? The kufars, many of the people of the book will appreciate out of jealousy on their part, being able to make you coverers after you have believed. So uh, this is, this is, this, these are the occurrences of the people of the book. And there are also many other use, many other occurrences of the word kitab, book, prescription, in the Quran, which uh, in which it characterizes a community depending on the use it makes of the kitab. And I've counted, uh, like I told you, 46 occurrences, uh, excluding the other the other uh, 32 uh, of the people of the book. And so we will look at them, and also we will find. Um, Common, common themes. Again, can we just mm -hmm. can I interrupt you there? Sorry. Um, so, what exactly is your understanding of the this sense of covering up? You you you're not saying that they are changing ah. the text. You're you're in, you're suggesting that they are reinterpreting it in a way that perverts the the meaning of the text. Is that would that be right? Yes, that's the, the, exactly. It is, it is exactly this. They are covering the text with something. But we will see this in, the, in those other major offenses. It will, it will okay. come uh, right in the um, right now. <laughs> okay, sorry, jump the gun. So, what what other major offenses in the use of the book? And there are among them Moses people, the people of the book. Then clans that know of the book only their own claims and their only conjectures. So they give a sort of false testimony about the scripture about the the book. Uh, also, they commit forgery. Woe then to those who, with their own hands, compose the book and then present it as coming it coming from God in order to make a vile profit out of it. It could be the covering you were referring to, Mel. Uh, yeah. They compose a book and they present it as coming from God, even though it does not come from God. Um, they still refuse to recognize the prophecies who announced the coming of the Messiah. And when a messenger came from God, confirming what was already with them, some of those to whom the book had been given threw the book of God behind their backs, as if they did not know. Um, there is trickery also as an offense in the use of the book. Those to whom we have given the book recognize it as they recognize their children. But some of them hide the truth, even though they know it. And those who hide what God has brought down from the book and say it at a low price, etc. Another trickery uh, offense. Another false testimony. And there are some among them who rub their tongues while reading the book to make you believe that this is from the book when it is not from the book. And they say this is from God when it is not from God. They knowingly speak lies against God. 
uh, another Kufa offense, Kafir offense, all the believers, if you obey a group of those to whom the book has been given, it will make you coverers after you had faith. You've had faith. And another Kufa offense, we have brought down the Torah in which there is guidance and light. It is on its basis that the prophet would submit it to God as well as the rabbis and teachers judge the affair of the Jews. For they have been entrusted with the custody of the book of God. And they are the witnesses of it. And those who do not judge according to what God has sent down, they are, these are the coverers. So they judge according to something else, maybe the book that they have written and which they claim uh, that, that comes from God, even though it doesn't come from God. And so this is the main offense of the people of the book. They have written the Talmuds, they have sanctified the Talmuds, and even though maybe all the whole of the Talmud might not have been written at the time of the 7th century, the oral um, interpretation was there. And it is, this is the covering, but the, um, this is the covering, and this is what the, the people of the book are, um, oh, I'm... I'm <laughs> Can I this jump in the, there for a second? What the people um, of the book are, are guilty of, exactly. It, oh, people of the book, why uh, do you mix the false with the true and knowingly hide the truth? So this is... Can I jump in there? Now, but this is referring to the Talmud, to the wrong interpretation of the Torah made by some Jews, the Talmudic, the Rabbinic Jews. So for example, we see it in Surah 2 here. Well, do you hope that such people, the Jews, will believe with you when in fact a group of them, after hearing and understanding the word of God, knowingly altered the famous falsification uh, route, uh, HRF route, when uh, the, uh, they alter, knowingly altered it. And when they meet believers, they say, we believe, and so on. Woe then to those who write scripture with their own hands, and then say, this is from God, to make a vile profit out of it. Can I interrupt and, uh, you for a second? Yes, Odin, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes you're in, in the middle. Um, so, um, okay, so they're opposed to the Talmud and, and, and uh, I presume the Mishnah and so on, but they're not opposed to it in principle because essentially they are offering their their own Mishnah, their own interpretation of Scripture. <laughs> of course, that's Would the that thing. Be fair to say? <laughs> so they claim to have the, the, the real interpretation of the, of, the, yeah. um, of the book, of the Kitab, of the Torah. Yeah. And, and also, they claim to believe in the prophecies that announce the coming of Jesus. And uh, this is the main, um, the, main, um, the main, the main offense of uh, the people of the book. They should yeah. have recognized Jesus as the Messiah, and they didn't. And they wrote, um, they wrote, they wrote books, they, they wrote uh, writings um, to. to to hide the truth, to hide Jesus' messiahship, <clears throat> and so on. Can I, can I just ask one question? Mm -hmm. Why do you think the Quran is uh, so filled with uh, Talmudic stories if the Quran itself is uh, is saying that these people do this thing, the, uh, they are the Talmud writers? Um, you see, in the in the, um, the the Talmud was not um, a creation from the sixth or second or seventh or ninth century. It comes from um, a long tradition within the Jewish people, and those tradition, some uh, went uh, to the Christians, some went to to the to the Jews, to the rabbinic Jews, and some to other Jewish groups. And so they share a common a common origin. And you see, when you when you when you read, for example, in the Quran, that uh, the one who murders one person, it is uh, as if he has murdered the, the whole humanity. We also read it in the Talmud, but it does not mean it's a copy of the Talmud. It can it can mean that it just it just has uh, a common origin. But uh, but what evidence do you have that uh, this doesn't come from the Talmud, but it could come from something other than the Talmud? Because uh, there is nothing else other than the Talmud which says this uh, commentary. So where do you think could the Quran borrow it? 
let me reverse the question. Where do you think the Talmud borrows its writing? No, no, the Quran, I'm saying that when, when it says that whoever murders one as if he murders humanity, do you think yes. the Quran got it from anything other than the Talmud? Uh, I, um, where does it come from in the Talmud? It comes from a Jewish tradition. What I claim is that we found the same Jewish tradition, some of, some of it, in the Talmudic Jews, in the Rabbinic Jews, in the Christian Jews, and also in some other uh, Jewish groups that, that uh, were very influential at the beginning of Islam. Mm. It, it, My see, it's, it's not because you, you, you see the, the exact same thing in two different writings that one has been copied on another. It can comes from uh, a common source. And this common source, I think, is the Jewish tradition. Mm. Might they be objecting to um, the later uh, Talmudic writers or the later Mishnah as opposed to the Jerusalem mm -hmm. one? So, you know, the Babylonian one that they have an objection with. Or is yeah. it that they're objecting maybe just to a subset of the Talmud that they have a problem with? So I'm yes, trying to... There are many different Talmuds and also, um, like I told you, the, the, all of the Talmuds might not have been written at the time. So we we don't have to focus on the on the Talmud books, but on the on the interpretation that some Jews uh, had. On, on you see that, that that's a real meaning of the covering the, the the fact that they are covering the truth of the Scripture. What are they covering? They are covering Jesus Messiahship. They are covering, for example, Daniel's prophecy about the coming of the uh, the coming of the Messiah. This is but what can I, can I ask? About. Can I this ask one thing also? Excuse me, excuse me, Murad. Yes. Yes. Uh, can I can I ask uh, uh, the Talmud writers? Did they say that this is from God? This is one question, and did they sell this prophecy for money? So does it fit the bill? Does what the Quran is saying about them happened? You see, the Quran is not an exact description of what happens. It mm. is a preaching, and the preachers, the, pre the preacher and the preachers, they, they criticize the Talmudic Jews. Mm. They say they, they are selling their writings, for example. They, they are, um, it, 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 it's not supposed to be true, but it is what the preacher says about them. Mm. Because uh, it could be. hate them. Uh, something um, could mean that they're, they're just making a living out of it, you know, they're making making a career out mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Some yes. some make a career out of it, yes, of course. So, as a conclusion of this part of the people of the book, we see that um, the, the KFR route does not mean to misbelieve, it means to cover the Torah with other interpretation with another interpretation, with the Talmud, with an interpretation which is not the one of the preacher. <laughs> and the covering is the hiding of Jesus' messiahship. Um, then, we can see also that all of the people of the book are not that worse, that bad. Because there is, in the Quran, a good community and a bad community among the people of the book. We see that uh, mainly in every verse where an offense or something bad is, is, is said about the people of the book, that it is not the whole of the people of the book. There are, there, are, there are some other people than the one who covers. For example, neither those who covers among the people of the book nor the associationists, those who covers among the people of the book. That means that there are people among the people of the books who do not cover, who are they? What is this community among the people of the book who does not cover? Haven't you seen the hypocrite thing, their fellow who covered among the people of the book, which means that there are among the people of the book, people who didn't cover. And there are some among them, among the people of the book, who distort the book with their tongue and so on. Some among them, not all of them, distort the book with their tongue. 
So the, uh, uh, here again, we have a clue that there is a good community among the people of the book, a community who is not uh, Kufar, KFR. Oh, you can believe? I just yes, can no? I jump in? That, yeah, the the issue really, the overall context seems to be that they're directing people to preaching the right message, and so mm -hmm. therefore they're they're pointing them away from the the wrong sort of preaching towards the right sort of preaching, mm -hmm. and that's what the that's what they're all about. Yes, yes, That'd exactly. But uh, who who at us the right sort of preaching? Who is the good community among the people of the book? That's the key of the um, understanding of the Quran. I think the, the, the um, really is that the key. And um, we see this in many, 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 many verses uh, like this one. Or you who believe, if you obey a party, only a party from among those who have been given the book, they will turn you back as coverers. So it means that there are people who we are not we are not that bad in the in the one that has been given the book if the people of the book believe it will be better for them some who have faith but most of them are perverts some of the people of the book have faith who are they not all of them are like of the, this is a very very um, important verse of the can people, i just yes you say it's for the, the 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 word that's used there has has different connotations in English. So here, a, a better tr translation would be distorters rather than perverts, because nowadays we don't tend to ah, use it. Yes, of course. <laughs> in, in a sense. Okay, okay, I get your point. <laughs> we, it, 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 in the old sense of it, it meant a distorter of the truth, but nowadays people just view it as a sexual thing, which uh, clearly yes, it's yes, not. Uh, in this very, very right. I should, like um, it is correct. correct. It is correct. But just modern usage, people wouldn't necessarily <laughs> yes. get the right to do it. <laughs> yes. So let, let's get now. Let's get to the this very important verse, uh, Surah three, verse uh, hundred and thirteen. Not all of them are alike. Of the people of the book are a portion that stands. They rehearse the verses of God all night long, and they prostrate themselves in adoration. They believe in God in the last day. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And they hasten in good work, good works. They are in the ranks of the righteous. So there is a good community among the people of the book. Surely there are among the people of the book, those who believe in God and so on. They are humble toward God and do not sell the verses of God at a low price. Say, O people of the book, you will purchase for anything other than believing in God, in what has been brought down to us, the gospel, and what has been brought down before the Torah. But most of you are perverted, which means most of you, there is a tiny, tiny bit of you that is not perverted uh, in the right meaning of the word. <laughs> and, um, and those people form a good community. The coverers among the people of the book which means that there are some, some people that do not cover among the people of the book, as well as the associationists, which also means that the people of the book are not associationists, which means that they are not Christian, will not cease to disbelieve until they are given clear evidence. And this gets only in the best way with the people of the book, except with those who are unjust. So there are people within among the people of the book who are just who are a just community just people and among these are some who believe in it the same thing who object of verses but the coverers so we see that within the people of the book we have two communities communities of bad judeans bad jewish people a bad community they are the yahud the kufar the rabbinic the talmudic and they are the kind of uh, the sort of arch enemies to the preachers, to the good Judeans. And there is another community, the good Judeans, who are non-coverers, non-Talmudic. They believe, they have the right faith, they are believers. So the question is, who are they and what do they believe in? But here we just established with the Quran and with the whole of the Quran that there is a good community among the people of the book, a community of believers, and a community which obviously 
had a great influence on the beginning of Islam. So this is very solid ground here. This is um, this is the Quran. The Quran, as in its um, literal text. So now, what is this good community among the people of the book? Let us see um, in the Quran what uh, what it tells us. So they are good Judeans. They are opposed to rabbinic Jews, and they command the descent and they forbid the blameworthy. So it means that they are Judeans who belong to the right Judaic religion, and they abide by Moses' law. So they 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 are from. Um, a community, a Judaic community within the, um, the Jewish, the whole Jewish community, which is different from the rabbinic Jews, different from the Tablinic Jews, and they claim to have the, the, the right religion, the, the right Moses religion. And also they recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but they are not Christian, since the people of the book are not associationists, and they are opposed to Christians. And so we can guess, we can uh, deduct that they refuse Jesus' divinity. And also they hold the Torah and the gospel sacred, and they still have their unaltered text in their possessions. And they have the true faith in those texts, and they believe in God, they believe in the day of judgment, the last day, and they believe it is imminent. Hence, they do believe in the imminent coming of the Messiah Jesus. And here again, we have very, very solid ground on which to build hypothesis to understand Islam's origin. We have here a um, Judean community who was not rabbinic, who was not Talmudic, who recognized Jesus as a Messiah, but only as a man who refused Jesus' divinity and who believed in its imminent coming as the Messiah. And imminent coming meaning the end of the world, Jesus would come back, and establish God's reign uh, on earth. This is what the Quran tells us, literally. So, what did the good community among the people of the book teach the believers? They teach their faith to the believers, the Arab audience of the, the preachers, and they are friends with them. They share the same food, as we see in Surah 5, uh, for example. And they, they teach the believers to abide by the same food laws. And we see that those food laws uh, are a kind of modified Jewish kashrut, the Jewish food laws. The food of the people of the book is permitted to you, and your own food is permitted to them. We also see that the believers are invited to marry to good Judean women. And hence, they are invited to form matrimonial alliances such as maybe Muhammad and Khadija. Khadija, in the standard Islamic narrative, we, we get to know that she was maybe a Nazarene, maybe very close to the Nazarenes. Maybe she was from this community, this good community. Um, and that this is an, a strategy to form alliances between those Arabs and this community of the people of the book, of uh, Jewish people. And again, it's in Surah 5, which tells us that uh, it is permitted to the, for the believers to, to marry the chaste from among the believing women and the chaste from among those who have been given the book before you, meaning the people of the book, but the good ones, not the bad ones. So we also um, understand that the believers have regular contacts with the bad Jews and they are taught to stay clear of them or to challenge their creed, to challenge the, the wrong face of the bad uh, community, the bad Jews. The believers have also regular contacts with regular Christians, the Mushrikun, and they are invited not to join them, not to acknowledge their wrong creed. And uh, for example, <laughs> not to marry their women and not to have any relationship with them. This is in Surah 24, verse 3, the fornicator shall not marry any but a fornicatress or a Christian, a mushrikul, mushrikatan. And as for the fornicatress, none shall marry her but a fornicator or a Christian, 
and it is forbidden to the believers. When we compare this verse to the, the former um, verse 5 in Surah 5, we understand that uh, the people of the book cannot be Christians. It, it is uh, incompatible. Incompatible. There would there would be a contradiction if we if we if we thought that the people of the book would be Christians. And we also see <coughs> that um, this invitation, this urge to marry um, uh, good Judean women. Um, is to make um, a good community of it. In fact, all of this pertains to um, the forming of a, co um, a community, a unique community, uh, a Uma, and it might be the meaning of the Uma word in the Quran. Um, the believers and the good Judeans form a kind of alliance there is an alliance between them. They share the same food. They abide by the same law. They marry the, um, their own women. And hence, they form a community. Can I jump in there for a second? Could this be yes. the origin of, of the Umaid group later, that these are what was formed from, from this early movement? So the Umaids are essentially this early movement. Oh, Would that well, be... Yeah. Oh, this I could not tell, but uh, I, I don't. I, I don't know whether I don't think there is a, um, uh, a connection between Uma and Umayyad. Is this your okay. claim? Yes. I well, I'm just, throwing, I'm just throwing. It, I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility. I have no opinion one way or the other. Uma, Uma is a very ancient word. We, we find it in the Bible. It's Um, the mother, and it means the tribe. It's it yeah. the, the community in a very um, tribal uh, way. Um, Can I just add something? Yes, yes, Moad, of course. Uh, about uh, Umayya and Ummi, no, uh, they are not the same word at all. But if you take the word Umma, and you will find that it's the same as Mecca. It has this diacritical mark. Now, mm -hmm. if you if you take it apart, it will be Ummami. So the word Ummami in Arabic, it means Gentile. So an Ummah means, I think, I'm, I'm going to ask Odin what does he think, but the word Ummah, I think it means the Gentiles. Can I just jump in on that? Because this is actually the angle I was I was mm -hmm. thinking in terms of. Because if, if this group was forming um, proselytes among the Arabs, then they would essentially be Gentiles, and therefore you maids in that sense of um, proselytes, Gentiles, would that work or not? not so and the Ummi prophet, the Ummi prophet would not be the unlettered. It will be the Gentile prophet. Gentile prophet, and it's it's not the Gentile prophet because if you, I, I don't know the the verse uh, by heart, but if you look into it, it's um, um, Rasul Nabi Umiyi or Nabi Rasul Umiyi. It's mm. the, the prophet that has been sent to the Gentile. Mm. The prophet for the Gentile. And who is this prophet? The standard Islamic narrative tells us it, it should be Muhammad. But the, who is the one who expanded the um, biblical alliance outside of the Jewish people? It's Jesus. But it's do you Jesus. think Jesus I is think it's Jesus that is, is the, uh, the Rasul the Nabi Umi. But isn't Jesus uh, from uh, the same root of uh, Isaac? Yes, yes. Uh, he's supposed to be uh, from the same uh, family as uh, Isaac. But you see, in the Quran and also in the, um, in the Jewish preaching before Islam, we see, uh, and also in uh, Christian apologetic towards Arab, Arabic people, um, we see... Um, a claim being made um, on on um, on the supposed uh, Ishmael ancestry of the Arabs, which would give them access to the biblical alliance. There, there were some Arabs in the first, second, uh, third uh, centuries that were converted to Judaism because at this time. 
Judaism was not closed as it is today, as it has become. Uh, Ju Judaism was um, uh, a proselyte religion, religion uh, which uh, origin which made proselytes. A proselyte is a non-Jewish Jew, uh, a yes. Jew from the nations. And uh, we have um, many, many sources from the antiquity telling us about uh, Judaized Arabs. Do you think that the Book of Jubilees uh, played a role in this? That uh, it uh, made Ishmael uh, part of this whole thing? It's not that he is the it's, 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 Hagar and Ismail. The question is not about the Book of Jubilees in itself, but uh, on the tradition that is expressed in the Book of Jubilees. The Book of Jubilees is the first writing in which we see um, Ishmael as being the, the patriarchs, uh, the patriarch of the Arabs. There is no such claim in the Bible. In the Bible, we, there is nowhere, nowhere we can find that Ishmael uh, would could be um, the ancestor of the Arabs. The first mm -hmm. writing is the Book of Jubilee. But you see, it's not the Book of Jubilee who created this claim. It comes from a tradition. So there was a tradition among the Jews uh, that um, the Arabs descended from Ishmael. Yes. And in the Quran, there is um, um, there are many many verses, many many preaching to to persuade the Arabs that they share a common ancestry with the Jews, and that they should join the alliance, join the alliance with the good community. Um, this is what I intend to develop on the next part of the expose, because. Um, I only unveiled a tiny bit of what the good community among the people of the book taught the, the, the believers. Because may, mostly the Quran, um, the Quran tells us about a, a sort of grand venture that the, um, the preachers are preaching to the, to the audience. Join the alliance, emigrate in God's path, become muhajihun. Um, we shall take Jerusalem together, make the Hajj. Hajj is an Hebrew word for a kind of pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And we shall rebuild its temple, the Beit. Hence, we can maybe um, maybe have the hypothesis that the rebuilding is a, of the temple is the, the key to, to have Jesus come back and, um, and to have the... The, the, to trigger the apocalypse. So this is to be continued uh, on the next part. We will see who are the Quranic Nazarenes. We will see, I think, this is my hypothesis, according also to Edouard Marigales, that the good community among the people of the book are the Quranic Nazarenes. And we will see uh, in detail what is this grand venture that I told you about, that the Quran is about. But here, at this point, we have established, we have very strongly established that at the beginning, very beginning, beginning of Islam, at the beginning of the 7th century, there was a community of, of the people of the book that were opposed to the rabbinic Jews, that were, they were Jews themselves, but they were opposed to the rabbinic Jews, opposed to the Talmudic Jews. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but he was only a man, and he was not divine. And they were very, very, very influential um, for the beginning of Islam, of course, for the converting of the Arab audience, we can assume that they were the ones who taught the preachers that we that we see in the Quran, and this is established. On it's a very very strong claim now. This is the Quran. This is not some um, divagation. This is not some um, conjecture. This is what the Quran is about. We have established the existence of uh, a Jewish community. 
this Jewish community. So next thing is will be to to try to know who is this Jewish community exactly, and uh, <laughs> what did they want the what did they want the believers, the Arab uh, audience to do. Um, so, can I just jump there um, on on something you said earlier? Yes. Um, you know, people often um, think of Hagarenes as people who are descendants of Hagar. But another interpretation that Joe give mm -hmm. is that the Hagar were um, proselytes. So essentially, the, another understanding of being like a son a son of Hagar is to be a proselyte, a proselyte, mm -hmm. um, someone who was Judaized, um, and so. This could actually be part of the, the the sense of this that they were Judaizing the Arabs and bring them into the fold. Mm -hmm. Is that your your understanding? Yeah, you, you see, uh, it, can, it, it could fit with what I what I just said. The thing is, what I just said here, it is very very strong, very solid, and it has nothing to do with. Um, secondary sources, uh, extrapolation, conjecture. It is only the Quran. And therefore, we can build many hypotheses, like, for example, this one. And it could fit. Yes, it could fit. Why not? But uh, what, I am, what I'm telling you now, and it is very, very groundbreaking, because when we study Islam, we don't have much in terms of sources, in terms of uh, solid evidence. This is solid evidence. And on this, you can build very strong um, historical hypotheses. Thank you, um, Odin. Um, would you be willing to take some questions from our audience? Of course, of course. Of course. We'll give um, first uh, the first question to... Uh, Ali Dawa, Jason Byrne, um, can you ask Odin what Nasara means in Arabic? Ah, Nasara in Arabic doesn't mean anything. In Arabic, Nasara doesn't mean anything. It is not an Arabic word. It has become an Arabic word. If you want, you can have a sneak peek at what's coming next, because uh, who are the Quranic Nazarenes? <laughs> uh, this is what I was supposed to... <laughs> To, to, to show on the next part, but um, the NSR word in Arabic, it means to help, to support, to protect. And Nasara doesn't have anything to do with helpers, protection, protector, supporters. We see that the word that is formed with the NSR root is Ansar. And Nasara does not fit the Ansar meaning, but some Ansar occurrences could refer to the Nasara. According to the linguists, Nasara is a direct transliteration of the Aramaic Natsaraya, or the Hebrew Natsri, uh, the plural Natsrim. And it is a direct translation, uh, it's not a translation, it is a transliteration into Arabic. It's not the same thing. And the word Natsaraya, it is a very complex word. Um, I shall leave this, leave this for the... Um, for the next part. Mel, okay. Mel, can I I'm can here. I just uh, can I just take a shot at this? Yeah, okay. The the word Nasara, it comes from the Hebrew Nutsri. And actually if you read this word in Arabic Nasara, you will find that it ends with a uh, yeah. Yeah, you could read it in Arabic as a or as e. I think it should be read as e. So Nutsri, Nasari. This oh. is it comes from the because the, the Hebrews in the beginning used to call the Christians Nutsri because they are from Nazareth. So it means the, the people of Nazareth, but in a twisted way. That's what I think it is. Okay. But in I, Arabic, it doesn't have a, a meaning. Now it doesn't have a clear meaning. I, I partially um, agree with you, Murad. Uh, but I think there's more to it. Because uh, Nutsri does not mean Christian. Etymologically, Christian is... Uh, comes from Christos. Christos is Messiah. Christian mm. means disciple of the Messiah. Messianic, maybe. Not Srim, it comes from the 
and sa er root in Aramaic or in Hebrew, and it does not mean Messiah. Uh, this root means to protect, to defend, um, to conserve, and uh, as it is the case in the all the Semitic language, we have a, a basic meaning and derived meanings. And the derived meaning, one of the derived meaning of this root is the netzer. Netzer we found in uh, Isaiah, uh, I think it's chapter one, verse eleven, which uh, tells us about the um, the netzer of David, the netzer of uh, uh, Jesse. Um, <laughs> Let me see. Morad, you, you obliged me to, to go to the <laughs> next part. Um, in Isaiah 11, 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root, a netzer. So the derived mm -hmm. meaning of nets is the, this branch. This branch is the royal blood of David. So the netzer is the prince. And so if the Netzer is the prince, and the prince is supposed to be the Messiah, which is supposed to be the king of Israel, so the Natsaraya are the Messianic people before the coming of the Messiah. But once the Messiah has come, the, the meaning can change because the Messiah is Jesus. So the Natsaraya are the disciple of Jesus as he is a prince, because Jesus is from uh, the royal blood of David. Mm. And so the Natsaraya are at first the first Jewish people, the Jewish disciples of Jesus. But thereafter, the Christians adopted the Christian denomination, which means the disciple of the Messiah, Mashe in Aramaic, Masi in Arab, in Arabic. And then the one who kept on the Natsaraya denomination, they were the ones who were from Jewish origin, Jewish ethnicity, and who did not want to be called Christian, disciple of the Messiah. And when the Hebrew uh, accused some of them to be Nazrim, which is exactly the same word as Nazariah, they referred to the people who recognized Jesus as the Messiah, whether they, would, they, they are Christians or whether they are not Christian, Jewish people, who recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but not as, as God himself. We can, so we can the word, word Natsaraya uh, has had a meaning um, as the designation of the Jewish disciple of Jesus who are not Christians. We can leave but, that to the next Because step. at the same time, there still were some um, Orthodox Christians who who kept on the Natsaraya uh, denomination. And for example, in, the, um, in India, in India, the, um, the evangelization, the Christ Christianity came during the first and second century with, um, with St. Thomas and with the Jewish communities that were established there. And the local Christian called themselves, the, and still, do call them, themselves uh, nowadays Nasrani. They have mm. kept on the, um, the um, Aramaic denomination, the first Aramaic denomination of the of Christians. So it's very, very complex. And it's much yes. more complex than what the standard Islamic narrative is um, telling us about Nasara. Okay, I'm going to jump in uh, with another question for you, if you want to take this question. Yeah, uh, in this alliance that uh, Odin proposes, where does the Manichaeans and the Sabians fall? Do you want to address that or, or not? <laughs> um, Sabians and Manichaeans are named in the Qurans as being um, good ones, but they don't seem to be part of the community. Yeah. Uh, they are uh, close to the, I think, the good community that is described in the Quran, but we don't know really, uh, but we, we don't have much uh, in terms of um, Quranic evidence for them. We only yeah. know that uh, in, in uh, two or three verses they are named and they are supposed to be um, good fellows. Yeah. Uh, no harm should be uh, inf inflicted upon them. 
this is also <laughs> to be um, to be to be <laughs> to be exposed in the next presentation. Oh, okay, hold on for that. Um, any more questions, everyone? Can I, uh, Mel? Can I just uh, go very quickly yeah. about this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the in the Quran, you don't have the word Manichaean, and you do not have the word Sabians, as people think. Uh, Sabai or uh, Sabian is uh, it means mm -hmm. from people of Sheba from Yemen, but the word oh. in Arabic, which is Sabiun, mm -hmm. this is in English Mandeans, people of Mandeans who are from Iraq. We call them in Arabic as Sabi al Mandaeya. So the Mandeans actually, in some old documents, are confused with being Gnostic Christians. So that's why when the Quran says the mm -hmm. Nasara and the, the Mandeans, they are good people and stuff. It's because they are already uh, close. They are they are good to the the Quranic mm -hmm. author likes them. That's what I think. Okay. Um, yeah. See, I, I think the Mandeans were um, a Baptist movement. They they, they baptized people, uh, and they they might have come from John the Baptist himself. And uh, what exactly. I'm telling you, this is is not um, as solid as uh, what I've told you about the, the Quran. But um, I, I don't know if you know Ella Wardi, Ella Wardi, which is a Tunisian scholar, mm. uh, Tunisia, then, who wrote uh, many books um, of Islamic tradition. She um, she took a deep dive once again mm. into the Islamic tradition, and uh, she compared all the um, all the books in Arabic, and wrote. Um, wrote the history of the beginning of Islam according to the Islamic tradition. And uh, she used um, some traditions that are not very no not known at all. And in, his ne in her next book, um, I've written it in my uh, Great Secret of Islam, in her next book to be published this year, um, she, she has found a tradition about Muhammad baptizing Umar. Mm. Which is very interesting. He place uh, Muhammad um, and Umar also um, in a kind of friendship with Mandaeans, or maybe they were Christians, I don't know, or heretic Christians, or um, Christian like people, but they, they might have been close to the Mandaeans. But this is very, very odd, very, uh, very strange to see that uh, <laughs> Muhammad, according to the Islamic tradition and according to the most Sahi of it, um, Muhammad baptized uh, Umar. <laughs> you heard it here first, um, folks. <laughs> so another question for you, um, Odin. If the Quranic community are Christians, why do they sometimes use Talmudic stories? Um, the, the community I was referring to is not the... From the um, um, uh, okay, okay, no, no. I, um, I, I stepped on the wrong foot. Um, I told you that the audience is Christian. The audience is Christian. And the preacher who belong to the community, to the Quranic community, try to, to teach them their faith. And in this faith, there is some uh, Talmudic story or some uh, Jewish uh, tradition story. But the audience is not Talmudic at all. The audience is uh, Arabic, Christian Arabic. Maybe not that orthodox, may, may they, uh, for sure they, they were not very, um, very rigid and very uh, straight Christians, but uh, they were not uh, Talmudic. Another question. Uh, can you ask Odin about his understanding of Proto-Arabic script? Proto-Arabic script. Um, I don't really know what rational dawa is uh, mentioning. <laughs> um, uh, what, I, what I do know is that uh, we find uh, Arabic writing in the seventh century, almost with the, the dots and stuff and uh, their criticism. For example, in the Egypt uh, papyri, which means that the oldest Quranic fragments the one, for example, from Sana'a, who do not have the dots and their criticism, which, which means that they were 
they were written like this in purpose. The Jack criticism, at least an archaic Jack criticism, existed at this time, but it was not used on the uh, Quranic, the oldest Quranic fragments. Why was it not used? Because those fragments were not supposed to be published, were not supposed to be read by others than the world who wrote them. There were drafts, there were notes. This is the very proof of it, because the diacritism existed and it was not used. So yeah. there were something personal to the preacher. And my hypothesis, Galais' hypothesis, is that um, those, those fragments, those notes, those drafts were collected, were copied, recopied, re recopied, and it became the Quran. And the diacriticism was added uh, centuries later, not centuries, but um, tens of years later. Later. But from my understanding, when they did introduce the various dots, it started off quite inconsistently as well. So sometimes they used them, sometimes they didn't. It's only later that the rules got more formalized. That's one thing, another thing that I've read in uh, François Desroches, François Desroches is one of the, the very specialists of the oldest uh, Quranic fragments. He wrote it about the, um, the, the um, folios that are in Paris, in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France that there were um, different copists that copied those, um, those, those folios and that the Jacquitism was kind of, um, there was no rule in it. And every copist did what he thought should be the Jacquitism, which means that the copist did not know what they were copying. They did not know the meaning of it. They copied and recopied a text which they did not understand, which also explains us was well, why during the 8th, 9th and 10th centuries, when the Quran came into the hands of the traditionists, they invented stories because they didn't know what the text really meant. And they still don't know nowadays. They still keep yeah. on inventing stories to explain the text. That's a good point. Another question here from uh, Noel. I wanted to ask about the Nestorians. Odin didn't mention them at all. Why? Oh, <laughs> Who did they uh, uh, I mentioned Arabic Christians. Uh, when we speak about Nestorians, uh, it's about the um, Iraqi Christians, Chaldeans mainly. But there are two kinds of Nestorians. There are the real Nestorians, which means the one who were really uh, her heretics, or not heretics, but uh, um, the, the one who thought that Jesus was not God. And they were the one that were called Nestorian by the Western Church, because the Western Church called every every Eastern Christian, so every Aramaic, uh, Eastern, uh, Aramaic speaking Eastern Christian, a Nestorian. So uh, I haven't spoke about them because I, I don't know uh, I haven't found them in the Quran yet. Uh, maybe the people of the gospel I mentioned, the one occurrence of the expression people of the gospel could refer to to them. But uh, really, I don't know. They, they don't seem to be in the Quran. And mostly, I, I spoke only about the Quran during this presentation. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I, I want to just uh, add this for, for the viewer who is asking, AJ Dews, he, he suggests that maybe the word Masara means Nestorians. So he can find this paper and read about it uh, if he likes. I, 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 yes, 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 yes. Uh, but there is nothing in terms of Quranic evidence for it. We will see in the second part of the presentation. The Nazarene are people of the book. They are people of the book, which means they are Jews. They are of Jewish ethnicity. They, look as a, they have a kind of Jewish religion. So they cannot be Nestorians. Yes. Uh, Another, according, to the Quran, according to the Quran. Yeah. Another question here, an interesting one, is what do you make of the two phases in the Quran, the Meccan phase and the Median hmm. phase? Um, 
I would uh, quote uh, a French scholar Jean-Jacques Walter, who did um, a unique analysis of the Quran uh, with um, mathematics, mathematic methodology, the code theory or uh, ADT or ATD, I don't know. Um, and he says that the distinction between Meccan phase and Medinan phase in the Quran is a grammarian artifact. It's completely artificial. Alors, of course, the Quran, um, the preaching in the Quran um, spread uh, among um, tens of years, maybe. So maybe we can distinguish some early preaching and later preaching. I think there are some later preaching. I will um, speak about the um, Surah 9, the beginning of Surah 9, as I think it is a later preaching um, on the next part of the presentation. But mostly the Mecca and Medina phase uh, invention from the standard Islamic narrative to, to find a solution to, to the contradiction of the Quran. To the, the, the verse that contradicts themselves. So they invented the story of uh, the prophecy, the revelation, and um, Asbab and Nuzul, the, 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 the way the revelation was, was made. And, and, and with this, they, they kind of got rid of those contradictions, but they're still there. And uh, on this, I would quote also um, 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 a French scholar from the beginning of the 20th century, his father Henri Lamance, who I think he got it all. He got it all on the Quran and the tradition. He made an article in uh, 1910, more than 100 years ago, uh, which is called uh, Coran et Tradition, Quran and Tradition. And um, he worked on the tradition, and he realized that the tradition was not written as an um, historical report of what happened, but was written in order to explain the Quran. And, um, and that uh, you cannot understand the Quran, you cannot understand the standard Islamic narrative without the tradition. You see, it's a kind of vicious circle. And if you abide by the standard Islamic narrative, you cannot get hold of the Quran. You cannot understand the Quran. The vicious circle keeps on uh, circling. And then he understood that all of this is uh, a trick, uh, a kind of swindle. And I will quote him. So it's my translation of his, uh, of, of his, um, of, of his article, Quran and Transition. Uh, when the Islamic tradition claims to be an independent source of information, the result of a vast investigation organized by contemporaries of the life of the Arab prophet, we can consider it one of the greatest historical tricks the literary annals remember. And this was written 100 years ago. Yeah. And it, is, uh, it has never been um, truer than today, more true is, than today. Is it possible that the different um, sections might be because they're from different preachers and they have different points of view and that's the reason for the contradictions, do you think? I, I think it might be, yes, yes, of course, it, it could be. Uh, one thing also is that um, there might have been some um, some um, some division among the preachers. Because yeah. uh, we'll see it in the Nazarene uh, part, in the Nazarene expose. Um, there are some odd statements about the Nazarene. Uh, some seem to be good, some seem to be bad, but it's only in one or two verses. So yeah. it might be this, it might be this. But you see, it's like I told you, we don't have much in terms of uh, evidence to, to get to know what happened. We have yeah. this text, the Quran, and it is uh, complex. We can uh, unveil some of its complexity by reading it as, a, as an historical source, reading it literally, literally for what it is, and only for what it is, not uh, abiding by the standard Islamic narrative. But even though we don't have much, we don't have much. 
we have a lot we have a lot but um we don't have much to get into those, those sophisticated um, um, issues you are <laughs> you are referring to um, another question here is from veronica um, is there any historical evidence for a different treatment of Jews, Christians, and pagans by early Muslims? John Bar Pinkaye said that there was none in the 680s. I'm not sure what she means by there was none. Uh, you know John Bar Pinkaye's uh, source? He I've read that the, the conquerors was, were only interested well, in. It, uh, means, it means non, uh, non different treatment. Non different treatment. Oh, they okay. see them all oh, as right. the same. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And um, yes, that's that's what John Barbecaille wrote. That's also what we can read in um, Robert Oyland's uh, last book, uh, In God's Pass, uh, which I know you read, and uh, which is very, very, very interesting. And uh, yes, I don't seem to have been um, different treatment. Yeah. But the Arabs, I think, this is not my presentation, but this is what I developed in my book. I think the Arabs were were not um, very different from the from the Christians. There were only Christians that believed that the end of times was very very near, that Jesus uh, would come, the Messiah would come, and he did not come back. And uh, from from there, they assumed the power. They took the power from the from the empires. Mm. I think the empires left the power from the, for for them for many reasons, and um, step by step they built their ideology, and they pretended to be the Messiah instead of the Messiah. They pretended to be the um, the one who would establish God's reign on earth. But it took some time. It's not until Abdul Malik Abdul Malik that we really see. Um, a strong statement of the, um, the Arab chief, the Arab uh, leader, being the Messiah, being the one who establishes God's kingdom uh, on us. So before that, they were only interested in, in ruling, so getting taxes, uh, maybe a, a bit of loot, slaves, or I don't know. Um, but there were... Um, they were seen as Christian by the, the Christian authors of this time. Mm, maybe with a, a bit of de deviance. Uh, when one speaks, uh, wrote about uh, Muawiyah as praying in the Holy Sepulchre of, of Jerusalem, it means that Muawiyah is kind of a Christian, but also the author, I don't remember him exactly, uh, says that he's not that good of a Christian. It's a strange question, but a question nonetheless. We see, for example, in some um, uh, in Muawiyah's uh, coins that he struck crosses and Christian symbols on his coins. We see on epigraphic uh, writings that there were also crosses uh, on them, uh, epigraphic writing from Muawiyah. So. Um, this was not Islam at this time, not Islam yet. M maybe the ideas, the, um, the hopes that, um, that are at the, at the very core of Islam were there, but uh, Islam as a religion was not uh, formed, was not uh, formalized. There was, there was no um, biography of a prophet. There was no prophet. There was, there was no Quran. There was no revelation. It was something of... Um, a Christian uh, millenarism movement. Can I just add to, to what you've said? Um, there is a Finnish um, rock inscription expert whose name escapes me for the minute, but but he, he described the end of the 7th century and the early part of the 8th century as a move from there being everyone in, you know, in the same sort of group and then there being an outgroup eventually forming. As their identity became more and more solid, gradually they became an outgroup, and so therefore, it's then that the various Christian groups were were persecuted because they were now seen more as outsiders. Whereas in the early days, uh, there wasn't that strong sense of in the in group and the out group. 
it's very uh, he, he, he talks about Christian as being um, as uh, Arabic Christian Arab uh, Arabic Christian conquerors being persecuted or he speaks about the the Christian uh, general population um he, he well he just basically from the evidence from the rock inscriptions he, he he's basically suggesting that the sense of the group ident identity really only started to take hold in the early part of the 8th century so before that mm -hmm. there wasn't the basis oh. for, for treating some groups as outsiders because they hadn't reached that kind of clarity at that yeah, point it's a bit um, more it's, it's a bit like robert Orlein's uh, orion's book but you see um to, to look at Christians in the Middle East in the seventh century, even at the end of the seventh century, as being outsider is very, very, very strange because the Christian at this time, there was something like 95% of the population of the Middle East. Uh, there were no outsiders, there was the population. Yeah. And um, I think in order to understand what happened during this time, you have to, to to make comparisons and for example the the, the best comparison one of uh, one uh, one that i like because it is very um very re revealing is to compare islam with communism uh with what happened in russia uh in 1917 when the revolution uh, put the, the bolsheviks in, in power there were a very tiny minority of people ruling over uh, a, um, a Christian population. But the whole state was supposed to be communist. And so this very tiny minority of um, less than 1% of uh, the, the, the Russian population ruled over 99% of Christians. And step by step, more and more people became communist. And um, maybe at the time, I don't know, there were something like 50 or 60 percent, maybe more of the population that became really that uh, adhered to the Communist Party and that became communist. But it took time. And it's the same with Islam. In Islam, the, the, um, some Arab leaders took power, took the power in their own hands. They fought among themselves up until uh, one leader uh, emerged, Abdul Malik. And, uh, and they kept on fighting until one very big leader <laughs> emerged, a bigger, even uh, an even bigger leader, which was the first Abbasid ruler, Asafan, Asafa, yeah, and um, and it is a bit like the the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, at this time, there, there was one Islamic ruler, the first Abbasid Caliph, and step by step, he imposed Islam. He created Islam. They, as the Abbasid, created Islam and they imposed Islam upon the, the population. Yeah, um, the point that, that I was going to say there on that, I, I just lost it there momentarily, mm -hmm. is the Chinese sources suggest that the elites that were, were, were key to all of this were Persians initially. Mm -hmm. So that would still fit in with your idea that you could have a minority that belonged to one group Whereas the, the majority could be like being Arabs, mm -hmm. basically, um, their identity got merged with the elite. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that this they have spun it in, later to make the, themselves the leaders out to be Arabs. Whereas mm -hmm. the reports from their invoice to the Chinese in the 650s and even into the 750s was that they were Persian at the beginning. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. There's this contradiction, and it could be because there's a kind of um, a blurry line there between Arab and Persian along the borders in Iraq. Maybe that's part of the, the reason. It's hard mm -hmm. to know. I, I don't know much about those, those Chinese sources. I've discovered them uh, thanks to you, Mel, and your yeah. tremendous work you, you're doing with Sneakers Corner. Oh, thank but, you. Uh, yes, it makes sense. It makes sense. It fits with uh, Robert, Robert Soyland's perspective which is a bit more Westerner, <laughs> uh, but it fits. And it could also fit with what I've uh, exposed uh, with this thing about the, the, the Quranic evidence. But uh, you see, we have um, 
um, a construction, a, a multiple layer construction of Islam. We have the, um, the history at the beginning of the seventh century, the middle of the seventh century, and thereafter, and then and layer after layer, Islam is being um, constructed. I think it's probably a good point to, to wrap up. Maybe we could f finish maybe with it like a, a short summary, maybe. Do you like to kind of, uh, for those maybe who found it all quite a lot to take in, could you give us kind of like a, a bird's eye view in terms of yes. what your whole point is today? What I've tried to, to expose uh, tonight is uh, a kind of a global reading of the Quran and a literary reading of the Quran, which means to read the Quran for what it is, what is written in it and not what um, other text tells us the, um, the Quran is. And by doing so, by, for example, by looking at all of the occurrences of this crucial expression of the people of the book, we see that the Quran tells us that there was a good community among the people of the book. We see at first that the people of the book were the Jews, the people of the Torah. They were not Christians, they were not Muslims, they were only the Jews, the people of the Torah. And um, within the Jews of, of this time, there was a good community, um, a tiny community. And uh, those Jews believed that uh, Jesus was the Messiah, contrary to the other Jews. They believed that um, they did not believe that Jesus was divine, that uh, the, they, did not, they, they were opposed to the Christian in that sense. And they also believed that the end of times was imminent. And hence, they must have believed that Jesus would come back, uh, which is a logical conclusion. And uh, we see also that those people were very influential um, within the, the, the first Muslim community, within the Arab audience that listened to the, the preaching that we find in the Quran. And um, those findings are very, um, very strong, very solid, because um, they, um, this, is, this is the Quranic text itself. It's not um, a conjecture about something that has been copied and recopied, and we, we find it uh, hundreds of kilo, thousands of kilometers away. I'm not referring to the Chinese sources, <laughs> but it is very, it is a very solid ground on which we can build new hypotheses to understand the beginning of Islam. What was this community of Jewish people? What was it exactly? What what was the project? Why did they teach uh, preachers to preach the Arabic uh, Christians? What happened? And uh, this, shed, this shed, uh, sheds a, a new light on uh, Islam origins. I, I don't, I don't uh, pretend, I don't claim to have find it, found it all. Uh, of course not. It is a huge, 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 huge uh, subject, topic, the field of uh, research. But I came to have found something solid. And it is <laughs> a very precious thing uh, in this field of study because we, we don't have much in terms of evidence. Yeah. I think one of the things that really struck me is that when we look at the word Quran in its Aramaic sense of lectionary, mm -hmm. and then we see that the 10 references to it being an Arabic Quran or an Arabic lectionary mm -hmm. okay. makes perfect sense if you're talking about it as another book not the book that we call the Quran but another book because a book never has to claim what language it's in it's obvious to anyone who opens up a book what language it's in so clearly it's about another book mm -hmm. and straight off once you accept that point then your 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 thesis really is on solid ground and it's it's such mm -hmm. a radically different yeah. interpretation of what you're you're looking at to get into my thesis you have many um, many starting points I've started yeah. with the people of the book. You can start with the Quran, the Arabic Quran. You can start with the Beit, the temple. You can start with the Hajj. You can start with the Nazarenes. But it, it, it all comes uh, all it all comes together because because it's a truth, in fact. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is what the truth is. 
when you find something true, it keeps on being true. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd see there's a there's a one of our subscribers here believes that um, a Nestorian uh, patriarch called Hanan Nisho is is the link to Abdul Al Malik. He, basically, he thinks that um, Hanisho is the source for the Quran, but you would claim that many of the parts of the Quran actually are contemporary with the invasion of Jerusalem in the early part of the seventh century. That's there's a time. Yes, uh, I think so. Many parts. I think most of it. Um, uh, and there are some um, who dates um, a, a bit after. Uh, I think that maybe a bit of Surah eight and the uh, beginning of Surah nine. Yeah. It, it, it's just um, in 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 order to 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 understand it to 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 study it, you have then to 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 look outside of the Quran. When yeah. you into the Quran, like you said, you you can can start with the the Arabic Quran and so on. You can start with the people of the book, like I did the Kufa, the Mushrikun. You can start also by the Grand Venture. I'm prepared to, to talk to you about in the next part. The Grand yeah. Venture is about um, seizing Jerusalem, taking Jerusalem, taking the Masjid al-Haram, which is another key, another starting point to understand the Quran, the Masjid al-Haram. When we look into it, when we look every occurrence of it, we see that it is not Mecca, it is not the, the Haram in Mecca, it is the, um, the ruins of the, the the temple from the ruins the um, the place the place the mount the temple mount in jerusalem yeah, yeah. and uh, and there was then uh, several attempts to take this place and we know two of them historically we know two of them we know one in uh, 614 and 14 jerusalem was taken by a coalition of persian troops jewish troops from babylon babylonian Babylonian territories and um, Arab uh, Arab warriors. First attempt and a second attempt in uh, 638, maybe a bit um, earlier, or six or maybe 635. We don't know for sure, but uh, let's say six 638. And we know because we have uh, several different testimonies, several different independent sources from different people, from different locations, and contemporary, contemporary to the event, to the event, we know that the temple was rebuilt in yeah. 38, 640. This is another solid ground on which we can build something. And then in the Quran, we see some passages, some verses that speak about um, a time when the Masjid al-Aram had been conquered. And then we can ask ourselves, was it in 614? Was it in 638? What changed with this conquest? And then we can try to, to figure why the narrative in those verses seems to be different from the rest of the Quran. Why, for example, the Nazarenes are being described as vile people there? Why they should be? Um, why the preacher asked God to, to 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 make them perish, to 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 fight them? This is in Surah nine thirty, for example. Uh, may uh, may God uh, fight them all. I think something like this. Okay, I think we'll probably a good point there. We'll stop. We'll stop there. <laughs> okay, it's been two hours. <laughs> Odin, um, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, we'll be back. Thank with you, you, thank you, Mel, for for your work, for this channel, for everything you, and thank you, Murat, also for everything you you do. Thank you very much for being on the channel. It's it's, it's been brilliant, and we'll we'll look forward to part two. Yes, yes, maybe next week. You yeah. should also look forward to the English translation of the Great Secret of Islam, the book, you, my book. Uh, I'm working on it right now. It surely is a huge, 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 huge work, but um, I will try to have it at least, uh, at least uh, to have the PDF file available for free next Saturday. 
Okay. We'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to work. A lot of work. Whoa. Okay. Thank you, Mel. Moral. Thank Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, uh.